The next item of business is First Minister's questions, and at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday, parents in Glasgow were protesting cuts to teacher numbers. They say they are fighting for their kids' education because these cuts will make it, in their words, impossible for schools to support pupils properly. In Glasgow, over 100 teachers have already gone, and it's proposed that number will rise to 450. Across Scotland, teacher numbers have declined for two years running. And a new Scottish Government report, published this week, suggests that the SNP may abandon their manifesto pledge to increase teacher numbers by 3,500. The First Minister made that promise when he was Education Secretary. So will he be honest with pupils, parents and teachers today? Is he going to stick to his promise to increase teacher numbers by 3,500 in this Parliament? First Minister. Presiding officer, the commitments that have been given by the government in relation to teacher numbers are commitments that have been given in good faith to strengthen the provision of education in Scotland. And I want the government to work with our local authority partners to deliver on those commitments. But of course, the approach that we take is hugely dependent on the resources that we have available. The government has obviously taken steps to expand the resources that we've got available to us. If the government had not taken the tax decisions, for example, as they taken, we would be over a billion pounds worse off in relation to the funding that we have available. But I have to answer directly Mr Ross's question about the challenges we face in the public finances due to the pressures of inflation and the uh, persistence of austerity that is framing public expenditure from the United Kingdom government. But I assure Mr Ross and parents, most importantly in the city of Glasgow and around the country, of the government's commitment to sustained investment in education and to maximise the investment we can make available. Douglas Ross. Of course, that, that wasn't my question. The, the question was very specific on a specific pledge, not made by any other SNP MSP, but made by the First Minister. He was the Education Secretary who went to the country and told people, vote for the SNP, trust me, and we will increase teacher numbers by 3,500 in this Parliament. Uh, and if, you know, I'm not convinced, I don't think any parent, pupil or teacher will be convinced with that answer from John Swinney today. We were supposed to have a, a different style of politics, but it sounds like the excuses uh, are the same as we've had yeah. before. Uh, and sadly, John Swinney's record in education is one of broken promises. He introduced a flagship education bill that could have improved standards, then he abandoned it. He promised a free laptop to every child. Yeah. That never happened. Three years ago, the SNP said that Education Scotland would be reformed. Nothing happened. The government he served in promised the SQA would be replaced. It, it's still there. So on teacher numbers, can he just give a straight yes or no answer? Is he going to stick to his own pledge to increase teacher numbers across Scotland by 3,500 in this Parliament, or will it be more of the same broken promises from John Swinney and the SNP? First Minister. On the question of education delivery, let me just put a few things on the record of what this government has achieved. When we came to office in 2007, 63% of children and young people were being educated in good or satisfactory buildings. That figure today is 93%. 93%. It's a transformation of the educational estate in Scotland. We have allocated, we've allocated £145 million to support the recruitment of teachers in partnership with local government. So these are some of the things that we have delivered. Uh, the, Reform programme in Education Scotland and in the Scottish Qualifications Authority is being implemented. But obviously these are issues that I've just come back into office, so I'll be looking very carefully at the progress that's been made in this respect, because I've, I've, not, been in, I've not been on this front bench for 12 months or so, so I'll be getting much closer to all of that. 
But on the question of the commitment to 3,500 teachers, I want to be absolutely clear with people in Scotland today. We face very significant financial pressures in Scotland in our public finances. So the perspective on, public, uh, on the public finances has deteriorated because of the effect of uh, austerity, because of the cuts that have been made in public expenditure, and also because of the very significant inflation that we have had to wrestle with, which has resulted in teachers, for example, getting the best, becoming the best paid teachers in the United Kingdom as a consequence of our decisions. So the government will take forward its programme within the resources that are available to us. But I have to make clear to people, to be straight with the public, which I will be, that public finances are under enormous pressure and we will set out our commitments as we take our budget decisions. Douglas Ross. I'd, I'd quite like John Swinney to be clear and, and straight with this Parliament and, and just answer a question. I'll, I'll ask it for a third time and, and hopefully get a response. John Swinney, as Education Secretary, made a pledge to voters across Scotland that vote for him and vote for the SNP, they would increase teacher numbers across Scotland by 3,500 over the course of this Parliament. Is that going to happen? Yes or no? A clear and straight answer from John Swinney is what's needed. Because he has been Education Secretary in a previous government. From 2016 to 2021, he was Education Secretary of Scotland. And during that time, education was supposed to be the SNP's top priority. They, they wanted to be judged on education. But when he was in charge, Scotland's schools and the results therein fell to record lows in the OECD's PISA rankings. These tests measure performance in maths, reading and science. And on all three, Scotland's scores declined substantially when John Swinney was Education Secretary. So why did Scotland plummet down international school league tables on his watch? And for the third time, and hopefully getting an answer, will he say to the people of Scotland, is he going to keep his promise to increase teacher numbers by 3,500? First Minister. I have nothing really to add to what I've said to Douglas Ross about the, the, the financial position that we face, because the financial, posi the, the financial position is acutely challenging and difficult, and it's different, and it's different to the position that we faced in 2021 and back in 2016. So because of the, uh, you know, th there has been a rampant increase in inflation on the watch of the Conservative government. Let's hear the First and Minister. If, and if inflation rises, and this is, this is, this is Mr. elementary. Mr Hoy. This is elementary arithmetic, Mr Hoy. And we're going to have to go through some elementary arithmetic to help you out here with, the, with the, uh, understanding the answer. If inflation rises by... If inflation rises by 10%, the value of money available yeah. to spend reduces. Yeah. So I want to make sure we've got a, a well-supported and substantial teaching profession, but I have to live in the real world of the public finances available to me, despite the fact that the Conservatives oppose every single tax change we have made to boost the public expenditure that's available in Scotland. So. The government will take uh, these decisions in the proper course of its budgetary process. But can I just say to Mr Ross, when I was Education Secretary, teacher numbers rose. They were higher, uh, they, they rose during my term in office as Education Secretary. And one of the things I'm most pleased about, and I can't claim all the credit for this because my successors have delivered this since 2021, Record destiny, positive destinations are being achieved by young people in Scotland, and that's a tribute to the strength of the education system in Scotland. Douglas Ross. John Swinney wants to give credit to his successors as Education Secretary. We have 250 fewer teachers in Scotland in just the last two years. He's not being straight with the public about whether he agrees or not with his own promise to increase them by 3,500 in this Parliament. But we know already 
they're going down. Teacher numbers across Scotland are falling under an SNP government. And I'm sorry, John Swinney is reaching out across parties to seek uh, consensus and, and working together. Some of that has to come from him. He's got to be honest. He's got to give a straight answer. And I'm going to ask for the fourth time today, will he, as First Minister, commit to the promise he made to the people of Scotland to increase teacher numbers by 3,500. It is not difficult to say yes or no. Explain why it's no, but tell people, be honest, and say he's not going to do it. Because as Education Secretary, John Swinney went from one failure to another. His implementation of the SNP's Curriculum for Excellence was a mess. And he's smiling at that. It was a mess, Mr Swinney. He was at the centre of multiple SQA fiascos. Again, it's not something to laugh about. He broke promises to improve the exam system. He was supposed to close the attainment gap entirely, but he failed. He damaged Scotland's international reputation for education. For 16 years, John Swinney has been at the heart of a government that has let down pupils, parents and teachers. Now he's the head of that government. What's going to change? First Minister. Well, certainly what's not going to change is the script that we get from Douglas Ross every single... <laughs> so let, let, let's just talk about some of the achievements that were made in education today on the most recent data. Record levels of literacy and numeracy attainment at primary school mm -hmm. and improvements in secondary were recorded in the Curriculum for Excellence data on the 12th of December. There is a record low attainment gap between the proportion of pupils from the most and the least deprived areas achieving the expected levels in literacy and reductions at secondary level. Again, the Curriculum for Excellence uh, level data on the 12th of December. In the summer of 2023, we had the highest ever number of passes at National 5, a tremendous achievement yeah. by the children and young people yeah. of Scotland, and a record number of vocational and technical qualifications that were achieved. In 2023, higher and advanced higher pass rates were higher than those achieved in 2019. So I am going to be straight with the public of Scotland. I'm going to tell them it the way it is. Yes. So I'm going to be clear that we're under enormous financial pressure. Yeah. And my government, my, government is going to have to, my government is going to have to come to Parliament with information about the challenges we face in the public finances, and we will be doing that in due course. I've only been the First Minister for 48 hours, not even 48 hours. But we'll be coming to Parliament to be straight about the challenges that we face. But I'll also be straight with the people of Scotland about the successes that this government has delivered and which we're very proud of. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Presenting officer, the last two weeks have been all about managing the SNP and have had nothing to do with running our country or delivering for Scotland. But politics isn't a game. Decisions made by government have consequences. And the effects of these decisions over the last 17 years are playing out in communities across the country. The decisions John Swinney made as finance secretary and education secretary are being felt by pupils, parents and teachers. Since 2007, Scotland's education standards have declined and teacher numbers have fallen. The government claims they are fully funding councils, but their own SNP-led council in Glasgow has made a decision to cut 172 teachers this year and 450 teachers over the next three years. So a direct and simple question, will he step in, save these teachers' jobs and protect young people's education? First Minister. The first point I want to make is that the events of the last two weeks have been frankly traumatic for my party. I accept that. And they have had everything to do with running the country. Because I'm now here to lead this government and to lead it with the firmness of direction it needs to address the problems facing the country and to achieve our objectives. That's what I'm here. That's what I'm here to do. Now, on the question of attainment, I've gone through with Mr Ross some of the strengths that exist in Scottish education today, and we will continue to improve that performance and to support the education system to do so. 
And we will obviously work collaboratively with local government on that agenda because local government, the local authorities, the City of Glasgow Council are responsible for the delivery of education in our communities. I'll be meeting uh, with the leadership of the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities on Friday immediately after the first meeting of the Cabinet because I put the greatest importance on working in partnership with our local authorities. And one of the most critical points about working in partnership with local authorities is that we work collaboratively. I would have members of Parliament in here complaining all the time if I instructed local authorities what to do, and I won't be doing that. Anna Sarwar. Officer. John Swinney needs to confront the challenges he created over the last 17 years in local government and education. Now, I, I was with the Glasgow City Parents Group and many of the teachers affected yesterday. This cut in Glasgow will hit people in the most deprived communities the hardest. The very same working class kids whose grades John Swinney, as Education Secretary, attempted to downgrade shamefully during the Covid yeah. exams scandal. And of the teachers I met, one told me they had retrained two years ago and was now going to lose her job. Another hasn't been able to get a permanent contract since he qualified. And a third who said this doesn't feel like the thanks and reward the government promised them coming out of the pandemic. John Swinney bears responsibility for the broken finances in our councils and the decimation of our education system. So don't give us the warm words. Don't try and explain away the record. Tell the pupils, their parents and their teachers what are you going to do to protect their education? Yeah. First Minister. It's very important that we have an open discussion about the choices that face public authorities and public bodies. Yeah. And one of the issues that's faced Glasgow City Council, mm -hmm. which has cost the City Council yeah. a formidable amount of money, yeah. has been the resolution of the equal pay oh, disgrace yeah. that was field. presided over yeah. by the Labour Party oh, yeah. when they ran the Glasgow City Council. Yeah. Women women in our society for many, many years persistently were let down. The Labour Party in running Glasgow City Council went to the courts yeah. Yeah. to challenge the legitimate claims of low-paid women in the city of Glasgow. It's something the Labour Party should be utterly ashamed of. So I understand, I understand the challenges that face Glasgow City Council. That's why I'll engage constructively with Glasgow City Council and with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities when I meet the Convention on Friday. Yes. Anna Sarwar. Presenting officer, clearly no answer for parents, pupils and teachers in Glasgow, yes. but just obfuscation from this First Minister. Yes. Now let's look at John Swinney's record. As Finance Secretary, he broke local finances and slashed the budget for local services. As Education Secretary, he abandoned teachers, standards declined, the attainment gap widened, Scotland fell in the international league tables, and shamefully, he downgraded the results of working class children during the pandemic. And now as First Minister, he is trapped by the past, defending his own record while Scotland's children pay the price. Scotland once had an education system that was the envy of the world, and I believe we can get there again but continuity won't cut it. Yeah. To give our young people the education and opportunities they deserve and to unlock the huge potential of our nation, Scotland needs fresh leadership, new ideas and change. So after being at the heart of every single SNP failure for the past 17 years, why does John Swinney think Scotland should accept more of the same? First Minister. I've got good news for Anna Sawa. The fresh leadership has just arrived. <laughs> Members. And I'm... Let's hear the First Minister. And I'm... And I'm right here to deliver it. And you see, the thing, well, 
They're laughing because they're delighted I'm here to do it. That's why they're laughing. They're, they're over the moon that I'm here. They sent me here. They were all behind it. So, so, or the people, or the people, the people did send me here, Mr. Sabah. The people have sent me here on every election that I have been had my name on the ballot paper. My constituents have sent me here. And in 2007, the people sent us into government. In 2011, they sent us into government. In 2016, they sent us into government. In 2021, they sent us into government. And in 2026, under my leadership, they'll send us back into government as well. And, and in his absence of cheerfulness escapade today, can I just point out to Mr Sarwa that I think Scotland's got a very, very good education Absolutely. system and we'll continue to approve it in the years to come. Yeah. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. The Scottish Greens have been clear that we acknowledge the SNP's right to form a minority government, but we've been equally clear that the First Minister must quickly give a signal of the direction his government will take. Yesterday, that signal came pretty clearly. Progressive ministers sacked, and the second most powerful job in government given to someone who has opposed LGBT people's legal equality, who has expressed judgmental attitudes against abortion, and who has even expressed the view that people who have families without being married are doing something wrong. Is this the Scottish Government's vision for the future of Scotland, taking us back to the repressive values of the 1950s? First Minister. No, it's not. And it's not the direction of the Scottish Government. Uh, the Government will be led from the moderate left of centre position that I have always occupied and which is the policy position of my party and which is supported by all of our members. I set out on um, last Thursday, when I, a, a week ago today, when I announced my candidacy for the uh, leadership of my party, that I wanted to build on the work of the SNP Government to create a modern, diverse, dynamic Scotland that will ensure opportunity for all of our citizens. And on Tuesday, I made it clear to the people of Scotland in my closing words, in my speech of acceptance, that I offer myself to be the First Minister for everyone in Scotland, and that is precisely what I will do. Patrick Harvey. I'm not yet sure that the First Minister acknowledges or understands just how worried many LGBT people and others are in Scotland at the moment. But this is not only about equality and human rights that are at stake here, because the new Deputy First Minister has also explicitly criticised the role of fairer progressive taxation. Making sure that people on high incomes pay their fair share is the only way that the Scottish Government has been able to afford investment in climate and nature, cheaper public transport or the Scottish child payment. Without fairer tax policies, which the Greens repeatedly had to push the SNP into supporting, these things simply couldn't have happened. Now, next year, whether it's the Tories or the Labour Party, we know that the UK Government will continue with austerity, imposing deeper cuts than ever on Scotland. So does the First Minister accept that continuing on the path toward progressive taxation will be more important than ever. Will that progress continue, or will the First Minister give in to the right wing of his party? First Minister. Can I, can I just say that, uh, as, a, as, as a matter of history and record, that the Deputy First Minister was responsible for introducing progressive taxes in Scotland. Kate Forbes took those budget decisions, sought the agreement of the Cabinet, and they were put to Parliament, and I welcome the fact that our colleagues in the Green Party supported the measures that the Government brought forward. So I think it's pretty clear that Kate Forbes has embraced uh, the, uh, and not embraced, delivered progressive taxation. Uh, Kate Forbes is also, by delivering the progressive approach to progressive taxation, delivered measures such as the Scottish Child Payment which is taking 100,000 children out of poverty today. That, to me, is 
something that is to be warmly welcomed across our country, which supports the mission of my government to eradicate child poverty. Now, I take very seriously the challenge that Mr Harvey puts to me, because I want people to be reassured in this country by my leadership. And when I say that I want to be the First Minister for everyone in Scotland, I deeply mean that. I want to, to, to lead a modern, dynamic and diverse Scotland, a place for everybody, where everybody feels at home, at peace, that they have a place and that their place in our society is protected by my leadership of this country. Question number four, Michelle Thompson. To ask the First Minister what support the Scottish Government is providing to women in enterprise. First Minister. Pre Presiding officer, the Scottish Government is committed to implementation of the Pathways Report, which looked at how best to support women in entrepreneurship uh, ca can be delivered and address the barriers that they continue to face. We have allocated £1.5 million this year to support this work, building on the £1.3 million invested through the pre-startup fund last year. Michelle Thompson. I thank the First Minister for his response and I recognise the efforts made with the 2023 Pathways Report and hope that any funding can continue on a sustainable basis. Figures from FSB in 2018 suggested women-led businesses account for nearly £9 billion gross value add. Today's figure, of course, is likely to be much higher. Yet a recent report from Women's Enterprise Scotland articulates continued systemic barriers citing issues such as an increase in discrimination and unequal treatment of women in business. Will the First Minister and his new Cabinet commit to a focus on the value of women-led businesses as a key part of his stated aim of driving economic growth and as a means of increasing labour market participation, innovation and productivity? First Minister. President Officer, could I welcome the contribution to this discussion that Michelle Thompson makes, particularly well, in her question today, but also through her convenership of the Cross-Party Group on Women and Enterprise. And can I say that I acknowledge that, and recognise that our efforts to boost economic growth in Scotland would be greatly enhanced if the participation of women in enterprise was at an equal level to the participation of, of men in our society. So, it's, it, it, so our efforts have got to be focused on closing that gap to ensure that women are able to make a greater contribution to enterprise. So I welcome the points that she has made today and I commit the government in its economic strategy and the work that we're taking forward to specifically make sure that we close that gap and to work with women to and, and organisations like Women's Enterprise Scotland, who are a fabulous organisation, uh, to, uh, to achieve those objectives. Question number five, Jamie Green. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the First Minister whether he will provide an update on the Scottish Government's progress towards its target to increase the number of residential rehabilitation beds in Scotland to 650 by 2026. First Minister. President Officer, we committed over £38 million for the development of new and expanded facilities at eight residential rehab projects across the country. Investment in these capacity projects alone will provide an increase of at least 140 beds by 25-26, uh, boosting the rehab capacity in Scotland from 425 to 565, up over 30%. Three of these in Edinburgh, Dundee and Ayrshire are fully completed and operational. Alongside this direct funding, we are confident that our significant wider investment in the sector will contribute to boosted bed numbers and expect to meet our target of a 50 per cent increase to residential rehab capacity by at least, to at least 650 by 2026. We intend to commission a formal audit of residential rehab bed capacity in 2025 to provide an authoritative account of our progress towards this target. Jamie Green. Uh, can I thank the First Minister for his update? And of course, I think all our thoughts are with anyone who has experienced the loss of a loved one due to uh, drugs. Um, and I hear what the First Minister is saying, but the rhetoric and the reality on the ground are two very different things. Of the £38 million that has been allocated, the last Public uh, Health Scotland audit into rehab beds showed that that produced uh, only an additional 32 beds of capacity. It's nowhere near the levels that it needs to be. And I, I think there are many substantial barriers to accessing rehab uh, that still remain in audit. Uh, the audit report shows that. Now, last week I had the great privilege of visiting one such centre called The Haven in Kilmacomb, who provides residential rehab care. Now, they told me directly that they have the ability to increase their capacity by 18 beds 
in a very, very short space of time, but have faced substantial uh, problems in accessing government money. Endless bureaucracy and red tape are holding them back. And that story is repeated right across the country, First Minister. The money is supposedly there, but the bed capacity simply is not. And that's the reality on the ground. Scotland's drug death crisis, I think, truly is our crisis, and it's our national shame. People are dying, First Minister. The strategy is not working, I'm afraid. So in this newfound spirit of being honest with each other as politicians, will the First Minister be honest? The strategy is not working, the drug death numbers are rising, and will he personally commit to making this his number one priority? First Minister. I... First of all, let me associate myself directly with the comments that Mr Green has made uh, about the tragedy of drug deaths and the loss for families that are affected by uh, the, the effect of drugs. And it is a national problem that we have to address, and I give him that solemn commitment that we will do that. I've set out the, my response to Mr Green's question, but I, I hear what he's saying about the concerns from the Haven project that he visited in Kilmacombe. Um, I want to understand directly what those barriers are, because I have no interest in announcements being made and the practical reality not being felt within communities. So if Mr Green would be so good as to advise me of the details of that, um, Christina McKelvey has been reappointed last night to continue the leadership of drugs and alcohol policy within the government. And I'll ask uh, Ms McKelvey to engage with Mr Green, uh, but obviously I remain open to discussions very directly about how we progress on this national tragedy and give Mr Green the assurance of the seriousness with which I attach to the issues that he's raised with me today. Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Presiding Officer. May I welcome the First Minister to his place. The Safer Consumption Pilot is due to launch in Glasgow by early autumn. And across the chamber, I think there's widespread support for these facilities as just one of many tools required to prevent drug deaths in our communities. But can the First Minister confirm that there will be clear referral pathways to residential rehab for those presenting at the overdose prevention facilities who request or need that support? Because it's just one of many ways in which we can prevent people falling into the trap of addiction and, of course, death. It is essential because I've seen it happen elsewhere in the world, such as in Copenhagen, where it works very effectively. Within five minutes, a referral to residential rehab can happen from their overdose prevention facilities. Will the First Minister offer a similar guarantee? Yeah. First Minister. I, I'm, grateful to Mr, I'm grateful to Mr Sweeney for his kind remarks. Um, and, I, and again, I, I very much welcome the points that he's put to me. Um, th there should be a referral pathway in place at this moment. So the scenario, Mr Sweeney puts to me of uh, once the, the, the safer consumption room pr uh, proposition is, uh, is implemented, there should be a pathway available. But I, I, I take very seriously the point that he makes that there should be a pathway because we can only help people on the road to recovery if that pathway is available as swiftly as Mr Sweeney puts it to me today. So th th that, that is my expectation. But of course, as I become closer to many of these particular issues, uh, I will have in mind the issue that Mr Sweeney has raised with me. Question number six, Pauline McNeill. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service continue to prosecute postmasters when there was evidence that the Horizon computer system used by the Post Office was flawed. First Minister. President Officer, as Parliament will be, will be well aware, uh, and as the Lord President reminded me when I took the oath of office yesterday, the Lord Advocate and the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service are rightly independent from government in their responsibility for the prosecution of crime. I am advised that it was not until the decisions by the courts in England and Wales in 2019 and 2021 that the full extent of the issues with Horizon emerged. Until that point, the Post Office maintained that the system was reliable. Indeed, the Post Office told Scottish prosecutors in 2013 that its external lawyers had reviewed all potentially impacted Scottish cases and found no issues. In 2015, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service was not provided with further evidence which had been promised by the Post Office to demonstrate that Horizon was as robust as they suggested. Therefore, the decision was taken to no longer rely on Horizon until such time as that further evidence was provided. As we all know, the Post Office has have at best obfuscated and at worst hidden the issues with Horizon, 
It is only through the ongoing public inquiry that we are learning to what extent that was undertaken. Colleen McNeill. I also welcome the First Minister to his post. I would ask the First Minister to note carefully what I'm going to say here. We know that in 2013, post office lawyers came to Scotland to meet with senior procurator fiscals to convince them to keep prosecuting cases. But forensic accountant Second Sight interim report was given to Crown Office and flagged up that there were defects or bugs in the Horizon software, giving rise to 76 branches being affected by incorrect balances or transactions. But in an email to me this week, the Second Sight director, Ron Warmington, said it was that if there had been a little less na naivety from the Crown Office, it would have been beneficial. And if the Crown Office had at least taken the precaution of checking this report and calling him or the Second Sight offices, the outcome might well have been different. So does the First Minister agree that notwithstanding the independence of the Crown Office, but they should be fully accountable for the miscarriages of justice in Scotland because they didn't provide the checks and balances that they should have? They chose to continue to prosecute cases in five years, never wrote to a single victim or attempted to overturn any of those convictions until now. Given this, shouldn't the Lord Advocate come here to this Parliament and answer further questions? First Minister. Sir, officer, I, I, first of all, let me welcome the remarks of Polly McNeill and her welcome, uh, which is appreciated. On the issue of, we're getting, in, uh, Polly McNeill, from her long service in the justice committees of this parliament, will understand that we are getting in this question into territory where I will be intruding on, if I answer it uh, 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 in, in great deal of detail, on the independence of the Lord Advocate. And I, uh, the, I will not do that. The Lord Advocate is an independent office holder and, uh, and I want to ensure that I protect the independence of the Lord Advocate by my actions. So the, the issues that Polly McNeill raises are material to Crown Office decisions about the, uh, the, the prosecutions that have been taken. Um, I will relay to the Lord Advocate the points that have been made by Polly McNeill today. Um, I met with the Lord Advocate last night uh, to confirm uh, my desire for her to continue as the Lord Advocate, but I will convey to her the points that Polly McNeill has made, and of course we will continue to engage with other parties in Parliament about the appropriate way in which this issue can be addressed within Parliament. Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We know the UK-wide use of the Tainted Horizon computer system evidence was a decision of the Post Office. So does the First Minister now share my concerns that it appears clear that people at the top of the post office have continually obfuscated and provided misleading information over the years? First Minister. Hey, officer, I, th there's obviously an ongoing public inquiry that's looking at the issues that are material to Audrey Nicholls' question. And I am I, I'm struck by, in observing that evidence, how overwhelming it looks that the point Audrey Nicholl makes is a fair point. I think we've got to allow that public inquiry to take its course. But while that is happening, there is action we can take to remedy the issue of, um, of miscarriages of justice. And that is, of course, part of the legislative programme of the government. And the government will bring those proposals to Parliament. Russell Finlay. Thank you, President Officer. The Scottish Conservatives have tried to get the Lord Advocate in here three times to answer Pauline McNeill's questions and many other questions, mm. because Scotland's post office victims deserve those answers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yet the SNP and the Greens voted against this reasonable request. So I ask again, why won't John Swinney do the right thing, and why is he adding to the distress and delays of the Horizon victims? Yeah. First Minister. Again, Mr Finlay, as an experienced member of the Criminal Justice Committee and also a, and, and as somebody who knows his way around the issues in our courts and judicial system, that the Lord Advocate is independent in, our prosecutorial, in the prosecutorial decisions that are taken. I have said to Parliament that I will convey to the Lord Advocate the issues... That Let us hear the First Minister. Let us hear the First Minister. 
Uh, I will convey to the Lord Advocate the issues that have been raised with me by Polly McNeill and by Russell Finlay, and we will, of course, as I said to my answer to Polly McNeill, continue to cooperate with other political parties about the best way to address these issues. Question number seven, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that Scotland has the highest suicide rate in the United Kingdom, with young men being three times more likely to die than women. First Minister. Suicide prevention is a key priority for the Scottish Government, and as First Minister, it will be a priority for me. Together with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities, we published our 10-year suicide prevention strategy, Creating Hope Together, and an associated first three-year action plan in September of 2022. This is backed by a commitment to double suicide prevention annual funding to £2.8 million by 2026. We are tailoring our approach to ensure we reach people most at risk of suicide across Scotland. This includes a strong emphasis on men. Alexander Stewart. I thank the First Minister for that response. Last week in Parliament, the Suicide Prevention and Witnesses Panel included representatives from Scotland's Men's Shed Association. They are seen as possibly the most effective prevention and life-affirming movement and inspirational in improving men's health. The association will be expected to pursue alternative funding arrangements from out with the Scottish Government going forward. Therefore, can I ask why once again have the Scottish Government decided that their funding is not seen as a priority when it is saving lives? First Minister. If Mr Stewart will allow me, I, I'll look into the question that he's raised with me about funding for the Men's Shed Movement. I've had many associations, many happy associations with the Men's Shed Movement. Indeed, I had the great pleasure of opening the Men's Shed in uh, the village of Stanley, my constituency, which was emerged out of a collaboration with Historic Environment Scotland, which was an example of how government facilities can be used to create a, a, a men's shed and support it without direct funding being made available. And obviously, as I answered Mr Ross earlier, funding is under enormous pressure. But I, I, I recognise the contribution of the men's shed movement. I also recognise that my colleague Jim Fairley uh, just last week had a, a gathering in Parliament of a variety of different organisations supporting men who face difficulty. And I really welcome all of the efforts that are going on to support that effort. Rosa Grant. When considering population size, the Highlands and Islands has consistently had a higher rate of suicide compared to other regions. Mental health provision in NHS Highland has been variable over recent years, with the NHS Highland spending over £2 million last year alone on locum psychiatrists. Staff shortages are leaving charities such as No More Lost Souls, Mickey's Line and the James Support Group to fill the gaps. Can I ask the First Minister whether he will consider a different approach to recruitment of health staff in rural areas, such as financial incentives for permanent staff to relocate? We simply can't continue without the support we need for vulnerable people. First Minister. I, I, I recognise the seriousness of the issue that Rhoda Grant raises, and, the, and it applies not just in this area of policy that we're talking about. It applies in a variety of different areas. The, Education Secretary will be wrestling with these problems in relation to teacher recruitment as well. So there is a substantive issue that needs to be explored here to see if there is a way in which we can try to do it. Some of the teacher induction schemes actually do that already. So um, there is a serious point to be applied there. I would want to say that there is much good provision in the Highlands which is provided by some of the organisations like Shinty Clubs, for example, where there is a very good uh, outreach work done to try to support men who face difficulty and I very much welcome that as part of the approach that we need to take. Christine Graham. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, First Minister, given that the first few days after a person is dis discharged from a psychiatric ward, they are at their most vulnerable to suicide. But I understand there is a requirement they are visited within 72 hours of discharge by a mental health nurse. Now, this is very difficult if discharges on a Friday with the Monday deadline to deliver this, especially in rural areas such as my constituency, with long distances to be covered. Can I ask the First Minister to advise if there is any flexibility in such circumstances? to be practicable and to comply with that requirement, such as an online contact initially, but just initially? First Minister. I, I think the, the way I'd like to answer the question from Christine Graham is to say that although the 72-hour commitment 
is, is what we're working to achieve it within, we should get that contact there as quickly as possible. So we shouldn't view the 72-hour commitment as simply the, uh, the measure of what we're trying to do. We should be trying to work to get that commitment there uh, swiftly. Um, I think that there are uh, opportunities for um, a, a telephone call or a video call to individuals um, as, a, as a flexible alternative. And, uh, but I would stress the importance of making sure that support is in place at the earliest possible opportunity. Move to constituency and general supplementaries. I call Fergus Ewing. Uh, <coughs> presiding officer, it's with uh, considerable sorrow that I must report that uh, another person has lost her life on the A9. And I'm sure all our thoughts are with her family now. Uh, in this parliament, five out of the six political parties represented and no less than 122 out of 129 MSPs all support the duelling of the A9. And prior to this question, of which notice has been given to the First Minister, I secured agreement from one member of each of the five parties, including myself, to ask this question of the First Minister. I very much welcome his appointment and his approach to work cross-party. Will he therefore meet with the five of us to discuss how we can accelerate the completion of this duelling project and thereby prevent, prevent the risks of further fatalities arising? First Minister. President Officer, firstly, let me express my sadness at the uh, most recent fatality that has taken place on the A9 and express my condolences to the family of the individual involved. As Mr Ewan will know uh, from our long association, um, I have been committed to the duelling of the A9 uh, from the very origins of my first parliamentary campaign uh, for the 1992 election uh, in the North Tayside constituency where the uh, A9 passes through my local area. Um, therefore, I have been pleased that this government has delivered a number of sections of improvement of the A9. The Craig to Dalradi section that was put in place, the improvements at the, um, with the uh, Great Separated Junction at the Barn Lug Junction, uh, the uh, Cruben Moore improvements, and also the most recent uh, Lunkerty to Burnham improvements that have been, that has been uh, made into dual carriageway. And obviously the Moy to Tamatin section is currently in the procurement process and we hope that is concluded shortly. So I want to assure Mr Ewing of the Government's commitment to, to dueling the A9. I'd be very happy to meet the cross-party delegation to discuss this issue and to explain how this project fits into the infrastructure programme of the Scottish Government and also to explain how the different steps we have taken within the capital investment of the programme have delivered the improvements to the A9 that the Government has already delivered. And Douglas Lumsden. Uh, President officer, the extremist Greens have been ditched from Government, so can the First Minister tell me if the damaging policy of presumption against new oil and gas will also be ditched? First Minister. I don't think Mr Lumsden's language is, is appropriate in no, Parliament. Exactly. Now, it's, not for, it's not for me to police that. I, I'm just giving my observation about that. That's a matter for the presiding officer. But I think in the spirit of trying to get us to a position where we all respect each other's opinion. I disagree with Mr Lumsden fundamentally on more issues than I care to imagine. <laughs> but he will be treated with courtesy by me. Yeah. And I think others should be treated with Absolutely. courtesy in this chamber Absolutely. as well. <laughs> so the government, and, and please, President Officer, uh, allow me to say that I was not making any, inf uh, I, I was not intruding on your responsibilities uh, either, but I just generally think the public expect us to be quite civilised to each yeah. other, yeah, and it would exactly. be nice if we could be. On the question, the substantive point of the question, I, am, uh, I, I want to make sure that we have a just transition for the oil and gas sector. We have a climate crisis uh, with us. We have to take careful and appropriate steps to 
uh, uh, to, to respond to that climate crisis, and that must involve a just transition for the oil and gas sector, and that's what the government will deliver. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. Point of order, Daniel Johnson. I am very grateful, Presiding Officer. I seek your clarification on Rule 13.2 regarding ministerial statements, because in recent days we have heard requests, both in questions today at FMQs, but also attempts to change uh, uh, the uh, order of business from the Conservatives. Uh, under Rule 13.2, it is my understanding that any minister or member of the government, including the law officers, can make a statement if they make a request to you to do so. Can you clarify that if the law officers were wishing to make a statement, that it is open to them to make such a request to you directly? Um, I can confirm, Mr Johnson, that any member of the government can make such a request. That concludes First Minister's questions.